So um, just to remind you, we have a lot of parents, a lot of parent professionals, self-advocates, professionals on the, on the Zoom call today. And I think I can speak for everyone when I say that you know, the health and wellness of our children and um, the children that we teach and love is, is of the utmost importance. And um, for some of us, and, and that's me, I think um, I would just add that, you know, the three kind of golden rules of COVID are a huge struggle for some of us. And, you know, that's masks, hygiene, hand washing, and, and social distancing. And uh, some of us that struggle with that are the same um, families that struggle with, with virtual learning as well. So I know you know that there's just tons of challenges and many, many stories out there. Um, but I, I really appreciate whatever questions we can get to today. And if you don't mind, if you could just give us a quick little intro to yourself and background, and, and then we could jump right in. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And Maura, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, this is uh, the work that matters so much to me. Um, and I'm uh, really just glad to um, give you some ideas from the department and, and above all else, take your questions. Uh, that's really what we need to do together to uh, find our way in a difficult time. So uh, by way of background, um, I came to Massachusetts to go to Boston College and then got hired as an inclusion facilitator by Newton Public Schools, became a director of elementary special education for Wellesley, uh, but decided that I really wanted to be in a more urban environment. So I became the special ed director for West Springfield Public Schools, ultimately the superintendent there. And now I'm the senior associate commissioner at the department. I oversee data accountability assistance and uh, all things special education. I also wear the hat of being the state special education director and uh, more like you, I'm also the parent of a child with a disability. So I attend my son's IEP meetings. I never tell people what my secret identity is when I go to the meetings. <laughs> and it's really interesting for me to be on the other side of the table. I and it's been there. Yes, <laughs> and very instructive and very informative um, to the work that, that I'm trying to do at the department. Uh, but um, hopefully you can see my presentation up on the screen. We can, and I'll just remind everybody um, that we're gonna hold questions to the end. And since there's so many people, um, chat them in and Carrie and I will uh, one by one tick them off um, at the end. So thank you. And, and Maura, as a teacher, I, I love the sound of my own voice. And so please stop me uh, <laughs> when I get to going a little bit long. Uh, do not hesitate to chime in and jump in. Uh, sure. But uh, keeping in mind that um, I really prepared this slide deck so that you have resources. I will not go through the items one by each, um, but you could go deeper using this deck or it's really drawn directly from our guidance document. Uh, that we released on July 9th. And so don't hesitate to also take a look at that document as well. Um, so really just um, kind of an update on where we are relative to reopening school, particularly for students with disabilities uh, for today's meeting and then time for Q&A. Um, this is a statement that I share with special ed leaders every, uh, every time that I meet with them. Uh, from March through the end of the school year, I met with them once a week. I do a, co a conference call, a Zoom meeting with about a, during the school year, about 1,000 special ed leaders. During the summer, it's been about 700. We're at every other week right now. Uh, but um, I just see so much fear out there right now and uh, confusion and in some places, you know, just almost a feeling of, of, of helplessness. And so I've really tried to instill in our special ed leaders that we have to be confident in our work. We have to operate from confidence. If we're just driven by fear, we are never, ever, ever going to be able to provide children the quality services that they need. So this has been my mantra. Um, I made a joke about not using it anymore. And then lots of special ed leaders said, please don't stop. We need to hear this message. We need somebody telling us that we can get through this. So uh, that's been our, our message. Um, but uh, really our, our updates as we begin uh, the new school year, and Maura just mentioned this um, on uh, June 25th, the department released its initial fall reopening guidance with the focus on kind of three critical uh, health and safety factors that need to be in place in order to, to uh, provide in-person learning. Uh, again, physical distancing, um, six feet where feasible, uh, no less than three feet. Uh, masks, uh, particularly for children in grades two through uh, second grade and beyond. And then hand hygiene, uh, washing hands all the time. And please know that of course we, uh, you know, called out that not all children can wear masks all the time. And so there is certainly an understanding of that. And in our um, summer and fall special education guidance, we discuss what to do for children who you have to work with closely, who can't wear masks, uh, who you know, might uh, display bodily fluids, you know, just that we want to make sure that we don't shy away from the work we know we need to do. Uh, there are safe ways of providing 
close in-person contact and services for children with disabilities. Um, and we just need to use the right PPE, have the right protocols in place, have the right training procedures in place. So that's uh, more detailed, frankly, in our summer guidance. We didn't repeat all of it uh, verbatim in the fall guidance uh, because we have kind of a captive audience with special ed leaders uh, looking, at, looking at both. Um, and we routinely remind them of, uh, that they have the information that they need. In our, um, uh, our comprehensive special education guidance that again, we released on July 9th, um, we uh, again, really focus on the idea that uh, a free and appropriate public education has to be provided even if, you know, even while trying to balance that against uh, the required health and safety, um, you know, features that have to be in place. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are really focusing on LRE and um, our guidance, if you look at our comprehensive uh, special education guidance for reopening, you're gonna see a huge emphasis on family engagement, um, that uh, parents are the ones who know what happened at home uh, this past spring when schools were closed, we need to draw on that information and we need to uh, really partner with families closely because we, we really have to do this work uh, in tandem. We're seeing a lot of districts saying that they intend to go um, hybrid for the fall. Uh, so there will be likely some aspect of remote learning going on for our students. And uh, we wanna do better than that than we did last spring, frankly. Uh, we have more time to plan and prepare for it. And that is not uh, you know, saying that you know, I'm blaming anyone for how things worked out last spring. This had happened so suddenly we weren't ready, but now we are. And frankly, it's why I felt very strongly that we had to get that our special education guidance document out as early as possible. This was one of the first follow-up pieces of guidance that the department released after that initial uh, reopening guidance on June 25th. We got right out there with our special ed guidance because it was, it's firmly my belief that if we want it to be better, we need to give districts as much planning time as we possibly can. They need to know what the expectation is and we need to help them get there uh, by you know, putting it in writing for them. And so that's really what we tried to do by getting this guidance out as quickly as we did um, after the initial reopening guidance came out. Um, a couple other key features of the um, guidance that we put out is the idea that um, we, we just, we want to say it very simply that students have to receive the services that are documented in their IEPs. Um, again, to the greatest extent possible with, by following the health and safety guidelines. And my mantra with this is that we are going to provide IEP services. Um, and the only thing that we're gonna give any kind of leeway on is that they, they might be provided differently. So, you know, we wanna keep writing IEPs for what school used to be. Um, you know, the, the schools that we were familiar with so, for so many years, that's all been upended now. Stay put needs to be in place for those services. But if we're in a remote model, those services can't be provided in exactly the same way. So they'll still be provided, but differently. And, um, but not like less, right? It's not less service, it's just perhaps different services. Um, so uh, as an example, um, you know, we heard from uh, various stakeholders in developing this guidance that you might have a child uh, who has full-time IEP, you know, full-time special education services, 300 minutes a day. So that student probably can't sit in front of a computer all day. Um, they can't just be on a Zoom meeting for six hours. None of us would want to do that. We can't ask our children to do that. And so let's make sure that we have a very structured uh, day for that student that involves uh, some time, um, you know, with their teacher, uh, some time doing, you know, maybe independent or inter interdependent work, but it's all very much um, set by the teacher uh, and it's structured. Um, and that being a critical difference than what we uh, were able to do last spring. And so, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the idea being that um, with more planning time, we can offer something that more closely resembles school in a remote setting um, than we were able to do perhaps last spring. Um, and so, but another, I, I was just talking about remote, another really key feature of our guidance document is that um, students who have the most complex and significant disabilities need in-person learning. They need full-time in-person learning to the greatest extent possible. So. For example, if there's a, a self-contained classroom for children with more significant disabilities uh, and the school is in a hybrid mode, we would ask that this school uh, allow for those students to come in full-time to not have a remote component of their learning experience and to um, have all of their services in person because we know it's much more valuable. Um, from there though, we, did, uh, we, we tried to present as many different ideas for in-person as possible because that's how much we value it. So if there's a model where the, the school is in a remote uh, phase of learning, 
um, because they can't get enough PPE, uh, because you know it's a decision that the district has made, not because of a surge, not because you know we all have to be frankly kind of homebound or uh, self-isolating, uh, but more because of um, you know uh, technical features like not having enough PPE, for example, uh, that we would ask that um, you still prioritize in-person learning for children with disabilities, particularly those with complex and significant disabilities. So maybe it's a part-time basis, um, allowing children to come in to get services. Um, like speech or ABA, um, so that we don't have students, um, it's not a binary, it's not either or, we want kind of continual problem solving to figure out how to provide those in-person services. And then finally, we also contemplate in-home or in-community services, uh, particularly if services can't be provided in the school. So this is more of the kind of surge issue where, um, you know, services just cannot be provided in the school, then we wanted to put out there this idea that services could be provided in the home they could be provided in the community, the library, the YMCA, there are places where um, you know, services also could be provided. So we're just trying to kind of instill the most creative thinking about um, in-person learning as we can possibly have. Um, in addition uh, to that, I, I mentioned the idea of students who have complex or significant disabilities. Uh, we actually defined that, um, who are they? Um, and I won't read this uh, line by line, but I know this has been something that districts have been working to kind of clarify with parents who've been asking. And so this is uh, how we clarified or tried to explain who we think most need to be prioritized for in-person learning. Um, and the, um, yeah, I don't, see, I don't think this is, I think I've already talked mainly about this. Uh, so, uh, you know, we know that scheduling is a big issue though in schools. Schedules often drive what schools do. And so we said, start by planning for the in-person that you're going to provide for students with disabilities, and then do the rest of your schedule, frankly, um, so that we uh, don't have this as an afterthought, frankly. Um, I already talked a little bit about kind of greater expectations for remote learning than uh, what we had last spring. And I think uh, there's our board really supported this because our board passed a regulation requiring things like attendance, participation, access to the standards, the state uh, you know, uh, curriculum standards, um, so I think it really bolsters uh, districts and, and kind of fortifies the need to provide a more structured experience overall. Uh, but then in, in our guidance document, we wanted to be clear that um, uh, the uh, last year we allowed for things like packets and assignments to count as special education um, supports or, or services, as long as they were also cl closely coupled with parent communication. Um, we're saying not this year. Uh, you know, that, uh, and we didn't make that up, that came from the U.S. Department of Education, so we were in keeping with a federal message uh, on what to do in a time of crisis. But we're, we're still in a crisis, but it's a different crisis. We have more time to plan. And so, um, you know, some of the key features of remote learning, like I already mentioned, are, you know, consistent schedule. We, when we, we do a lot of stakeholder engagement, um, and the ARC has been instrumental in that, uh, along with other parent organizations. Uh, and so we've gone out and uh, received feedback on, you know, what do you want to see that's different in remote learning for our children for this upcoming year? And so things like, you know, that consistent schedule. Um, speech is going to happen two times a week, Tuesday and Thursday at 12.30, done. It's not gonna rotate, it's not gonna float. Parents can predict when it's going to happen. Um, and then, you know, there has to be a synchronous component to it. Teletherapy or video conference lessons has to be involved and then, where there are assignments, where there are projects or work for students to do, they're supplemental. They're not the it. They are not the core of what children are getting. They are um, built off of the lessons that teachers are teaching. Um, and so maybe there is some, you know, and, and that's not, that's actually a good practice, I think, in a lot of cases of the teacher teaches it, the student needs some time to work on it more independently. Um, and like I said, that idea, I, I started with this idea of like, we're going to do six hours of, you know, in-person instruction with teachers and you know I quickly got shot down on that that you really can't expect kids like I said to sit in front of a zoom uh, for six hours that's just not healthy and so we tried to say there there does need to be this balance of synchronous and asynchronous but it's not all asynchronous um, for remote learning um, and uh, we talk about the need for infrastructure supporting the infrastructure needs um, and then also parent training we heard a lot about parents not knowing um, like that there was a zoom meeting coming up or how to log into Zoom. I'm just using Zoom as kind of a more generic term, whatever it was, a Google Hangout, a, you know, a Microsoft Teams meeting, or whatever it was, uh, their parents needed more training, they needed more support with troubleshooting, 
And so uh, really trying to build this into our guidance as well. Um, and then, you know, hybrid being a combination of both, I'm not gonna kind of go on here. Um, I, although this did just cue me to remember that uh, in addition to students with significant and complex needs who need to be prioritized for in-person learning, we also talk, uh, recommend prioritizing preschool age students. So those two groups, preschool age students and students with more complex and significant needs. Um, we also, um, and I won't go into this in great detail, but uh, we uh, discussed how we wanna make sure we promote uh, inclusive services and LRE. Uh, a lot of, we immediately, um, you know, as the last school year wound, wound down and people began to look ahead to a return to a very different type of in-person service, right? Where maybe we have fewer students in the classroom, we have all the desks in rows facing forward, I mean, it's sort of a throwback to, you know, the 1950s maybe or something in terms of public education. Um, and so, uh, you know, what will that mean for our students who need a lot more flexibility, uh, who need a lot more adults coming in and out of a room? And so we did, I won't go into the ideas, but we did try to share some ideas about how do you get services to students while still maintaining an opportunity for inclusion? Because we heard from a lot of parent groups in particular that said, we're worried that we're gonna lose access to inclusion and it's gonna stick. This is, we're, we're gonna turn back time on inclusion if we don't provide some advice on this. So um, we came up with several different ideas that are in the, the document to promote LRE. Um, but uh, it's really, what I wanted to get to um, is communication um, and spend a little bit of time talking here about what parents should expect in the way of communication. Uh, and we um, uh, write about us, DESE, strongly recommending uh, and cultivating excellent two-way communication between districts and families. Uh, schools and families, right? So this is, when I say districts, I mean charter schools, I mean traditional school districts, collaboratives, approved special education schools. Um, and one of the key things that we really got down to is, um, and I'll come back to this, but uh, we want um, the, the, well, the way that we're envisioning this is that, and we felt like we wanted to be very explicit about this, that we expect that at the beginning of the new school year, um, the child's teacher or IEP liaison, whichever it turns out to be, needs to contact the family at the very beginning of the year um, to talk about the parent's experience of, you know, what happened last spring, what can we learn from you about, you know, what your experience was providing remote learning last spring, and then um, have a conversation about what might be different about I, the, how IEP services will be delivered this year. Um, so if the school is in a hybrid mode, uh, that there needs to be a discussion about that. It's not just the school district telling the family, here's what's going to be different. There needs to be a discussion about it. This doesn't require a change to an IEP. In fact, we don't want to change the IEP because we want stay put to still be there for the services that students are entitled to. But instead, um, we want it documented so that everyone is clear about what will that schedule be for remote learning. Um, you, know, um, you know, I know the district that I live in, they're planning to do a week on, a week off. We want to know, like, what will his schedule? What will my child? What will my son's schedule be for uh, those days of uh, remote learning? It needs to be in writing, and it needs to be something that was discussed with families. Last year, we called it a remote learning plan, um, and uh, and we still will allow for districts to follow our template, which we will be releasing soon, or uh, to just you know send an email or put it in a um, parent notification in N one. Uh, document that's part of it's associated with the IEP but it's not the IEP uh, and so lots of ways of, of documenting this but it's documentation based on a discussion with families that allows families to participate and I'm still seeing you know some um, evidence of districts writing about parent notification and I've talked to special leaders and I will continue to drive this message home of it's not notification it's documentation and I want districts to be in a different mindset about it that notification sounds a little bit like a one-way street, um, like I'm notifying you of a decision that's already been made. That's sort of the worst case scenario in my mind. Whereas documentation um, is more about, we had a conversation about how services will be provided differently. And now this document that I will send the parent afterwards summarizes that conversation. Um, and you know, there, it quickly leads down the trail and we can see if this comes up in the Q&A about well, what happens if there's a disagreement. Um, but, you know, by and large, we want there to be a, a way for uh, there to be a discussion about how IEP services will be delivered. Um, and we really stress that, um, you know, uh, the way in which we um, are making sure that, uh, I'll just go back a little bit, uh, that we, you know, kind of think through what has happened, um, like where, 
what what has been the child's experience do they have any kind of new issues that need to be addressed um, as well so i think that's one thing that i i just want you to know notice in our document and you know um hopefully you know this will, you knowing about this hopefully will sort of lead to you and others that you will support in uh, knowing what to expect from districts, being ready for that phone call when it comes, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, certainly let us know uh, what your questions are about that. The thing that's not in this document uh, that kind of relates to what I was just saying is that we are very soon to release another guidance document because this is, this is what we do. We write a lot of documents at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, but this document will be about um, expectations for compensatory services. So. Um, when I talked about, you know, the family was, you know, by and large, uh, you know, at the front, in the front seat of driving uh, learning last spring for their children, right? They, they were the ones that saw what was going on. Uh, we need to value that, listen to that, and look at, you know, what it was there, to what extent did the child regress, fail to meet IEP goals, did the child not get certain services? And so what will compensatory look like? So that is a separate guidance document that will be coming out soon. And these are kind of connected because when we start to talk to parents about what was your experience last year and how are we setting up IEP services for this year, sort of the next part of that conversation is, well then, then what do we need to do if there was a need to either provide additional services or um, you know, make up for any lack of uh, service delivery last spring? Um, and I won't go into that more, that, that's forthcoming. Uh, but there are kind of two pieces of this puzzle that I just wanted to mention uh, before I go on. Um, you know, those are, those are a lot of my big ideas. Uh, more, do you want me to take five more minutes or do you want me to, uh, to pause now for questions? I think five more minutes is okay. I think everyone is, uh, is interested and in positive behavior supports, definitely. <laughs> okay. Yeah, great, definitely. So we, we put a big emphasis on this because kind of going back to what Maura was saying at the beginning about, you know, there are students who will struggle to wear masks. And these new rules are going to be a challenge. Uh, and, you know, students who've been at home haven't been in the structured learning environment for, you know, I was hearing Mayor Walsh this morning on the radio talking about it will be six months in September since kids in Boston were in school. And um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that we really focus on what are the kind of proactive stru structures that we want districts to be thinking about in terms of how to support ch children upon reentry. And I think one of the um, really important things is kind of the second to last bullet here that we want to really call out is that uh, we want to make sure that um, we don't over, you know, we don't end up increasing the amount of discipline uh, that we you know, kind of meet out against students with disabilities just because they're struggling with these issues. Um, and the discipline is a last resort, frankly. Um, and so we're really trying to get this message across. I know, that, you know, there's a lot of concern right now about you know, we're hearing about some families that are just against wearing masks and don't intend to send their children into masks. And so what does school districts do then versus the child for a medical reason, a behavioral reason, a disability related reason, simply can't wear a mask. And that's going to be a, that, and then there's going to be a little bit of gray area at times about what, why won't this child wear a mask? A lot of disabilities are invisible and we're not going to, in, in, the child maybe can't even tell us exactly why. Um, and so we, we think that, you know, we really want to be clear in our messaging here that you know, using a lot of, you know, restorative practices, diversionary strategies um, will hopefully help to cut down on the kind of, um, kind of automatic reflex at times of, you know, let's use a punitive measure when we don't have compliance. Uh, and we know that this is, I, I think this is going to be a challenging issue. Um, but, you know, I, I'm really pleased that we have um, in-person extended school year services happening um, in various places across the state, not everywhere I know, but it is happening, and I think a lot of districts are learning about what to do um, to support students. And I, when I've talked to special ed leaders, and this has been fairly anecdotal, um, they've, they've said to me they're, they're very pleased to see how flexible the students are, and that students they didn't think could wear masks actually are, they're tolerating it, or they're tolerating it for a period of time. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we, we can't underestimate the kids. Um, I think that by and large, our children will rise to this challenge and sometimes are even more flexible than the adults. Uh, I think we've all probably experienced that a bit. Uh, and so I have a lot of hope for this, but I also have a little bit of concern that I just want to make sure that we preempt as best we can uh, by focusing on the types of um, supports that will get our children kind of, you know, back into school, feeling confident about their learning experience, feeling ready to go, ready to learn um, as well. Um, 
we also uh, talk a lot about early childhood special education in our guidance document uh, and the supports that need to be in place um, for our youngest learners um, and you know what you know we kind of missed kindergarten screening last year so what to do about that because that's such a key part of child find at times um, and you know just rounding out the document just as a quick orientation uh, we also want to make sure we continue to reinforce the idea of monitoring student progress uh, transition for transition age students um, going on uh, you know our 14 to 22 year olds um, and then finally the last part of the document is about the um, PPE that's necessary the training to go along with it um, and you know the protocols that we need to be able to follow I'm really pleased that in partnership with the Department of Public Health uh, they created a video training series for school nurses on uh, donning and doffing um, protective equipment because it's you know protective equipment only works if we use it right and so that video is available on a on the platform that school nurses go to it's called BU Shield it's actually publicly available um, and uh, so nurses can go on B, uh, BU Shield and find the training video and I think uh, only just for our summer services so far I think it's had almost 3,000 hits um, where it, it is being used um, to know how to use protective equipment uh, safely and securely following these guidelines and we are continuing to work with DPH around supporting our nurses because I think that you know they are very much going to be on the front lines of this. I had a chance to go visit a, an in-person ESY program um, which I did very safely from a distance and um, I'm not going to repeatedly do it because we have to make sure we you know keep everybody safe and not kind of break into the bubble that we're creating in these schools but um, it really struck me how the role of the nurse has so dramatically changed uh, with providing in-person services. So I think that's a vanguard that um, we are going to continue to figure out how to support our nurses as we reopen schools. So um, I can go on about any of those topics at greater length, um, but Maura, why don't we see what, uh, what kind of questions yeah, we have? Thank you so much. That's just an incredible amount of information. I wonder if you could just pop back two slides to transition um, services. I think we might preempt a bunch of questions if you kind of talk about this a little bit more uh, fully. Sure, sure. I, one of the, so one other thing to mention about this is that um, we had, a, you know, the, the, there were so many difficult issues that arose from the kind of immediate closure of schools last spring. One of them is about students who are turning 22 um, during the time of closure. And so for that aspect of transition and, and what should happen for the children, the, the adults who turn 22, uh, we actually address that in our compensatory services document that again will be released soon. And so uh, anything about the students who, are, who are, are already 22 or about to turn 22, uh, we are trying to take care of there um, to say that, you know, there is a process, there are steps that should be taken. Um, we have that issue of, you know, they're no longer eligible for special education, so then what? I think we've actually come to good resolution on that. I need to get approvals on that document before, before I speak more publicly about exactly what that solution is. But we do have a solution there for those students who turn 22 or will turn 22. Um, the, um, uh, but, you know, we, in this um, uh, document, we um, encourage people to look at, even though um, things like co-concurrent um, programs at higher ed institutions might be limited, um, we still think that there can be um, opportunities there. Uh, and um, uh, so in my, um, uh, I do, like I said, I was doing these weekly updates for special ed leaders. The things that we put into my PowerPoints, which are all available online, and now we started to record the sessions and post the recordings online as well. Uh, but we did um, a, uh, a focus on transition services, and then we added that to our Q&A as well. So you don't have to go looking through my PowerPoints to find the information. It's also in our, I'm not sorry, our FAQ. Uh, that's updated on our website as well, uh, which hopefully isn't too hard to find. I know that sometimes navigating our website is not the easiest thing, but I think this is fairly straightforward uh, to find and let me know if you have any trouble. Uh, but we um, offer ideas like, you know, if, if we, the, the worst case scenario, right, is we're in a remote learning environment and we have to do transition. How do we do that? And so uh, we offered ideas like, um, you know, it's maybe a time for networking and for kind of um, job development. Um, so maybe you can't work at CVS in person, but what kind of networking can happen now? How can we get you ready for when we can return to in-person work um, during this time? So we offered ideas uh, such as that. Um, we also thought it would be a good time for more kind of the, um, the visioning for uh, what we want to see, what, what the in-person wants to see 
upon graduation or turning 22. And so, you know, how can this time at home kind of more closer together than ever before? Uh, so uh, kind of how do we how do we make the most of this? And so, um, you know, using this as an opportunity to have some of those conversations that sometimes we just don't have time for between us and our children and our providers around, you know, what's the vision? What are we working towards? How do we use the home environment for, um, you know, daily living skills, for um, what community functioning outside of the home might be available? So we just try to look at as many of the opportunities, frankly, that we can still seize upon and not look at this as a dead end um, to figure out, you know, what, what can we do now, even though it's not the same as what we can do when we're fully in person. So um, while we, I think we're a little shorter on this topic here than we are in our FAQ, so there are some more ideas, for example, in our FAQ. Uh, no, that's that's a great answer, and the fact that more is coming in the, uh, with along with the compensatory services guidance is great. So I, why don't we thank you first of all for all this incredible work, and let's jump into the the questions, which are building up a little bit. Um, Carrie, have you got any ready to go or? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, actually, Lucy has a question. Do schools have a choice whether to provide in-person services for the neediest students? Can they issue a blanket statement? We do not provide in-person services for a particular student. The only training for staff would be to wear a mask and wash your hands. Students, um, not all students can access remote learning at all. Yeah, so we, we agree that um, there, that's why we want as much in person as we can. Um, I'm not sure that there was a lot in that question, though. I, I wonder if we could tease out a little some of the aspects of it. Um, how did? It, could you remind me how it began? There was kind of a key part at the beginning about choice. Yeah. Okay, uh, ahead, so I think um, uh, Lucy was looking at it, it. Can schools issue a blanket statement that they don't provide in person services for a particular student? Yeah, and also. Sure. For S E S Y particularly. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we asked districts not to provide blanket statements, actually. Um, and for E S Y, so it, there's some difference just because there's an evolution in this process, right? That um, you know districts didn't have as much time to prepare for E S Y as they do for the start of the new school year. So we did put out guidance on E S Y that said. You know, think about your, your highest need students, try to provide in-person services uh, for those students in particular, uh, the students who didn't um, access remote learning, for example, who can't access remote learning, we want to do as best as we can. Um, and we, we uh, started to hear about districts that were saying, kind of on a blanket statement, we're just not going to do it. Uh, when we heard about those districts, my team and I made the choice that we would reach out to them, uh, that we would ask them to reconsider um, and particularly on May 21st, we released guidance on timelines. And if you take a look at that guidance, we talk about at the beginning, there's some bullet points and we talk about, um, you know, avoiding blanket statements, frankly. And this has been kind of my mantra uh, throughout this whole crisis has been blanket statements just aren't going to get as far in special education. We really need to avoid them. Um, instead, I want individually based decisions. I want uh, decisions based on what a, a child needs as opposed to kind of a, a policy decision um, across the board. And so uh, we did, you know, districts did have the choice as to offer in-person or not, but they needed to make that choice. Um, and I, I have a slide actually, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know the date of it, uh, but it's in one of my PowerPoints and it would have been from probably um, like late June, um, later June, uh, where um, I talked to them about, you know, if you, if you are, if, what you need to communicate to parents is what's the, like what's the rational basis for your decision about opening or not, or having in-person services or not? And what, what are the reasonable steps you've taken in order to um, you know, provide in-person opportunities for students? And so we, you know, we did hear from superintendents who said, you know, I'm getting this advice from you, Russell, here at the end of June, uh, you know, I'm gonna start ordering my PPE, but it won't come in for six weeks. And so that means that the only in-person I can do is at the very end of the summer. And I said, fine, you know, that's, that's reasonable steps that you are taking. You know, we have to just put all these pieces together. None of it's easy. I wish it was, but it's, it's all, it is very hard. And so, you know, if you can offer services in person later, but communicate, let your families know that that's what you're doing. Um, and when we reached out to districts, the ones that we heard about that were, were just saying across the board, we can't do it, um, we asked them to reconsider to take those steps to do what they could to provide in-person services. 
and to make sure that if they couldn't, they were explaining it as, you know, we can't get the PPE as opposed to, um, you know, we're just not going to do it. Um, and again, if you take a look at our uh, May 21st guidelines, we, we really tried to nip some of these issues in the bud uh, with uh, the way that we talked about using parent-friendly language. Um, and the, the last thing that I'll say about this is uh, we shared an exemplar from, uh, because I really appreciate special leaders send me stuff all the time, pictures and um, students doing in-person learning, frankly, this summer, which has been great. Um, and also just, you know, the notices they're sending to families, for example. And so I called out one that my county used as uh, an exemplar where they said, hey, here's what, here's what Desi's told us we have to do to provide in-person services. Here's what we're doing to get there. We'll keep you posted. And I thought that, that's all that I want. Like, that's what I want parents to know about. And, you know, the, the continual efforts to do better, to, to provide services for our children. So. Um, and I would just jump in there because I feel like there's more questions as we look down the yes. chat related to that, which are, um, we get that it's best for them to have in-person learning, but those who are um, most challenged, who are the ones that you're asking to make sure we get are back in there, um, are often also those ones who are medically complex or have underlying conditions that would make it um, you know, less safe for them to return. So I think that's where a lot of the parents that are in that group are kind of torn. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the day, it is a parent's choice um, as to, you know, whether or not to send their child in for any child. And um, I, it's also why I feel like we had to be hopefully as strong and clear in our language about what we want remote learning to be. So that if you do make that, I wouldn't even call it a choice in some cases, it's just what you have to do, right? Because for a, a medically challenged you know, child with medical challenges, there is no choice. The child simply just has to, has to be at home. Um, and we want to make sure that we provide as quality a remote experience for that child as we can. Um, so that's why we wanted to beef up the expectations around remote learning in particular. Or, or, or potentially another type of in-home service, potentially. Potentially. Um, again, um, my ex I've, I've heard a lot from uh, school and district leaders in particular who are saying, you know, you're asking us to fire on a lot of different cylinders. Like I have a limited, you know, I have a certain number of staff and if we're yeah. doing in-person in school, I can't send that staff home. And so right. that's particularly why we said, well, you know, if, if everybody's home and school can't be in session, then, you know, it is actually our expectation and uh, that there are, that in-person, in in-home or in-community is considered something that we want districts not to rule out. Um, and I've actually had some district leaders reach out to me to say, Russell, um, you know, that's the minimum, right? We can exceed this. And I said, yes, absolutely. That's our, the state's job is to kind of say, of course, you could do more than what we're setting as the standard, but, you know, you can't do less. Um, and so, again, if uh, I will wax on about that. I won't repeat myself. So, so I have, this is an important one. Um, uh, how can they access guidance in different languages? Yeah, it's a really good question. We did not write this guidance uh, with uh, parents as the audience. Um, it's very much, uh, we feel like we need district, like the, the people who take action based on our guidance are school and district leaders. And I was sort of slightly out of my mind to get it, this published as soon as I possibly could. Uh, we are, um, our next step is to uh, develop another parent-friendly letter. We did a parent letter in April. Uh, and um, so our goal is to create another parent letter. Um, it's not, uh, I'm just gonna be honest with you, it's not even drafted yet though. Like, you know, we've, I feel like we've really been focusing on making sure that we give guidance to schools and districts. And so the next thing up, like I said, is the compensatory services. Uh, but we feel like parents really do need to have in writing and translated just like we did last spring. Um, information about uh, what they should be expecting, what they should know, um, and more of a boiled down version. Our guidance document is really long. And so how do we kind of condense and clarify and say it in parent-friendly language and translate it uh, so that parents have access to the information. So that is on our radar, uh, but it'll still be a little bit yet before we get that done. Yeah, as a follow-up to that though, I just jumped down and on uh, Bowie says, what directions will DESE provide um, the school district which do not have bicultural or bilingual staff or teachers to reach out to the diverse families whose English is not their first language or 
or uh, do not provide multilingual notices or planning documents to keep them informed um, during the process of reopening and planning. Yeah. Kind of the communication going out. So um, I know I keep referring to these meetings that I have as special ed leaders, but they really are a conduit for getting information across. So last week, uh, I invited Lisa Liu uh, from UMass Boston, who is a specialist in language access for parents of children with disabilities, uh, to speak about what is the expectation around language access. So it's written about in our document repeatedly that an expectation uh, for interpretation and translation. And then I wanted Lucy to come and talk about the how. Um, what are some resources? What are some um, ideas around that? And so um, as, a, as one step in the process, uh, we had Lusa uh, contribute ideas. Another step is that we are about to release um, our um, supporting all learners document um, with a focus on social emotional learning and mental health. Um, and in that, there, that's a document that really focuses on parenting engagement and under, um, understanding. We have a resource actually already built on our website that that document will link to where uh, we set the expectation around, uh, you know, understanding the needs of a family, including the language access needs um, so that that's not overlooked. And then finally, um, the other important piece is that we've actually invested in this. Um, so I have a member of my team who's run a pilot this past year with five districts. Um, we're looking to see how we can expand it for this upcoming year where the department actually contracted for districts to be able to get access to interpretation and translation. And what we're going to add to that for this upcoming year is training because a lot of districts have people on staff who provide interpretation and translation, but they're not trained to do so. And so we want to get um, kind of existing staff better trained in how to do that. Uh, so I'm really excited about uh, the undertaking there and the districts are that they, they, they tell us this is what they really want is to get better trained uh, interpreters from within their district um, so that when they come, when parents come to IEP meetings, the right terminology is being used, for example. Uh, and so uh, UMass Amherst is actually our training partner and we're very excited about that, but then also uh, creating easier access to families to get uh, on the spot. Uh, interpretation is also something that we're looking to fund this year as well. The, the scale is though, it's sort of, it's limited in what the state can add. And so in my mind, it's a both and. We set the expectations for districts. And that's, I think, very clear in our special education comprehensive reopening document. Um, and we're also investing in helping them do the work. Wow, okay, great. Um, I'm gonna jump in with one more question here um, because I'm hearing this a lot. We were hearing, um, school systems furloughing many, many paraprofessionals. Um, and how, how can, what can we do about that to advocate? And you know, how will inclusion and happen without these paraprofessionals? How will our kids stay safe who have impulse control issues and other things? Um, worried about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, um, a lot of what we need right now is the, frankly, this in education across the board is the stimulus money from the federal government. And I think that there does seem to be a willingness to invest. The question is how much it, is how I would interpret it. Um, and so all of us kind of pushing to make sure that that funding comes to pass and that education gets funded will help a lot. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I think, and again, this is just me kind of pontificating and the proof will be in the pudding, but I think we could probably, if that comes to pass, I'm hopeful that we can restore a lot of what we, you know, we're worried we were going to lose when people were furloughed, uh, you know, by contract, right? It has, there's a date by which it has to be done, usually in early June. So there was a lot of furloughing, a lot of laying off, not even furloughing, laying off um, staff in, uh, uh, back in early June. And I'm hopeful that with some clarity by, I would say, August, I, I'm hopeful that we can get staff back. Uh, but I think that it's on all of us to make sure we advocate for those funds to, to flow through, to flow through to education, and that we need, you know, that we really need the money to keep the services in place. Great. Um, Carrie, I know you've been looking. Is there another question? Because I don't want to keep the commissioner too much longer. Um, do you see one or two more? And then the rest, we can make sure we get to him and he can get us back some answers as well. Sure. Um, I, I did see a few that the uh, remote, remote learning platforms weren't, weren't working for people. Um, just they're having problems with the, the Google uh, learning. And uh, what, what should people be doing about that? 
Yeah, and it, that's why in particular, we, we set this expectation that schools and districts would support families in their access to and kind of troubleshooting issues with any of the learning platforms that, that children use. Um, you know, in our, I'll just go back to that slide real quick. Uh, but we, um, you know, talked about here, it's right. right here. Yep. Uh, so supporting the infrastructure needed as well as, you know, the troubleshooting and access to the communication platforms. Um, we, uh, we now have a director of remote learning at DESE, you know, something that we never thought we'd have to have in the past. Now we do. Um, and I'm in frequent contact with her. Uh, for example, I was hearing from districts that uh, Chromebooks are on back order and that, you know, it might be hard for some districts to get Chromebooks before November. And so uh, I was just emailing uh, Jackie Ganser today, our director of remote learning to say, what are we going to do about that? Because, you know, this is going to be a problem if, uh, you know, families who can't provide the, the devices for their own children. We're hoping uh, more devices can come from the school district, but if they're on back order, that's going to make it very hard at the beginning of the year. So uh, I feel like we're, we're trying, as, as we put out this guidance and these expectations, districts are bouncing back kind of questions and concerns like that to us so that there's, you know, kind of a, a good problem solving, uh, you know, type of communication going on right now. Um, and that's an example of the type of thing that we're trying to support districts with so we don't have families left very flat footed when school resumes. And, um, you know, we heard last night that the uh, Massachusetts Teachers Association is calling for all remote learning uh, when school resumes. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's more to be seen in terms of how this is all going to work out. Uh, but where we uh, particularly see a lot of schools and districts moving towards hybrid, we intend to, can, you know, we, we feel like we have to devote more time and attention as well uh, to, uh, you know, to remote services too. So more to come on that. Yeah. So one more question that I see, um, uh, we're, we don't want to set our expectations too, too high because we understand what's going on in the schools are scrambling. Um, but we're, we're a group that's very used to data and, and having data shared with us around our kids' progress, around progress notes, around, um, and this whole learn on, you know, virtual learning platform, I'm not sure if, we're, if anyone has really received any sort of data or progress around, you know, how their child is doing. Um, and is that something that will eventually kick in for people so they can actually see if skills are regressing or if they're maintaining? Yeah, um, so we um, did put out advice on progress monitoring, for example, in a remote environment and how do you communicate with families about that? We, we had a lot of questions from districts about that at the end of last school year. You know, how am I supposed to collect data? Um, is it valid if it's coming, you know, if the teacher doesn't observe it and it's, you know, an assignment that's being sent back, how do I know what the child did, how much the child did on, on their own? Um, and so uh, we, we actually, we, we provided a lot of um, uh, tools and resources, I feel like. Okay. Um, other, other places, other states have worked out some ideas. We didn't feel like we had to reinvent the wheel. Texas, for example, uh, the Texas Education Agency uh, has put out a lot of, I think, very good resources for you know, if you're collecting data on discrete trials, if you're collecting math data, if you're collecting English data, um, how do you do that and kind of, you know, forms to use, for example. And so we didn't have to guess about how to do that. And again, in one of my meetings with special leaders, I went over that and showed them some of the resources that we made available to them. Um, but I think we're going to have to stay on that message. I was just looking at um, uh, not just for special ed, but overall, um, some ideas that came from kind of a, a group of state leaders about, and actually urban leaders and state leaders about how, what are different ways that like kind of using multiple points of data uh, to collect information about remote learning. Um, so not only just work samples, but, and not only just, you know, how many times a child has logged into the platform, for example, um, but also, you know, um, questioning and uh, valuing input from parents uh, looking at um, kind of formative assessment over time, uh, ways of kind of dipsticking um, how students are doing uh, that were, I thought, pretty creative. And so I think my agency has to keep pushing out those ideas because it is a very different concept than just being able to observe a classroom and seeing a student, you know, in their seat, finishing their work. You just can't do that as easily right now. So I think we have to keep pushing on that. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, I know that some questions came up about transportation and buses. Um, is that is more clarification coming out on that as well? So we, we put out transportation guidance and we had input on special education transportation ahead of time from a group of special uh, leaders and transportation leaders from across the state. And what I actually really try to do with our transportation document is to embed those ideas overall so that special ed you didn't have to remember what to do differently for special education than you have to do for all transportation. Um, so the guidance does have a small section on special education. I've been asked like, well, why isn't there more? And you know, I could be wrong about this, but we really did try to just make sure that we have kind of one set of expectations for transportation uh, for again, the protective equipment, for um, you know, uh, spacing, um, it, it applies across the board. And I think in my mind, that kind of universal design approach that we try to take with transportation will be better than having two sets of expectations. But we are answering questions through um, our FAQ process. And so we, we have an extensive uh, FAQ. Uh, I was thinking this morning when I was walking my dog, you know, I don't know who's gonna read how many questions we are answering and keep them all fresh in their mind, but at least there's a place where they can go. And so we are answering additional questions about transportation as they come in. And again, really just trying to apply that universal lens to it so that uh, people don't have to remember two different sets of expectations. That's great. So we'll get that link to, and send it along with your slides to, uh, to everyone on the Zoom today. Um, I don't want to keep you much longer. Uh, is there anything else that we should know going forward into the fall from your perspective? No, I think I, I appreciate this. Um, just a reminder that, you know, preliminary plans from districts are due to us this Friday and then their final plans are meant to be into us by uh, August 10th and um, posted soon thereafter. And so I know it's for all of us, it's sort of a wait and see to know exactly how we will reopen um, in the fall. And so, you know, for all of us, this is, it's a, it's a tense period. Um, it's a, it's a challenging period, um, but hopefully one where we can you know, just continue to keep that attitude of, we're in this together, we will figure this out together. Um, so we appreciate the questions that we get, they make our guidance better. Um, and so at the end of the day, uh, what I keep reminding myself is schools will open one way or another, schools are definitely going to open. Uh, when, when school, when, you know, September comes around, we are going to be back with teachers, we are going to be learning one way or another, it will happen. And that's helping me get through these days. And I hope it's helpful for you too. Well, thank you. I, this was so helpful. And maybe um, we can consider getting you on the calendar to come back in the fall and we can all tell you about how it's going. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I would look forward to that very much. Okay. Thank you so much. We really Thanks appreciate more. your time. And I'm not going to keep everyone else today with, with ARC updates. I'm going to let everybody go, but I am going to let you know that all these questions we didn't get to, Carrie and I will send along to the commissioner and, and also we'll put the link so that you can ask more questions. And also Kathleen will be continuing to meet um, with Desi and keeping us up to date. That's right. Sounds great. All Thanks right. so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and, and stay well and stay safe and good luck. Thank you.